Welcome to Black Lodge Publishing's series of short introductory talks on esoteric and other occult subjects. Just a quick reminder that before engaging with this talk, listeners should review the previous two lectures in the series and work with a pen in hand. Welcome to the third of our Black Lodge Publishing lecture series on the subject of alchemy and the thought tarot. In tonight's talk, I want to focus on another esoteric relationship between alchemy and the Thoth Tarot. And although this might not come as a surprise to some, but to others, I hope that it will provide a clearer understanding of the function of what we term the Lapis Philosophorum. For this, as we will discover, is another indispensable link between both subjects. Firstly, however, we need to establish a clear definition of what the lapis or stone is, or indeed is not. For example, here in the West, it was the greco egyptian alchemist Zosimus of Panopolis, who in the late 3rd, early 4th century AD, qualified in Greek the philosopher's stone by calling it Zerion. And as I noted in the last lecture, that apart from transmutation, this stone Powders or gum, when confected, can produce yet that of another materia, and one which is supposed to heal all forms of disease and provide for that of immortality. Hence, and for this reason, we more commonly refer to it by the term elixir. However, the term elixir should not be confused with the lapis or stone, nor indeed the red or white powders. And yet, although the term originally derived from Zosimus' Greek zerion, it is more readily recognisable to us from the Arabic el ixer, and that more commonly used in Latin elixir. Therefore, it would seem that the magnum opus or great work involves the practitioner in the production of an elixir, and this is in some occult way related to the lapis philosophorum. Yet, it is no surprise to learn that both the lapis and the elixir have remained central throughout the history and development of magic and alchemical theory and praxis. Unfortunately, however, they have come to be regarded not only as that of a single, and not well, unified substance, but one that is procured from out of another two, which in itself is procured from the materia prima. Therefore, the lapis and elixir seem to exist as one, and as previously mentioned, they seem to combine particular transformational qualities. Thus, the production of the stone and its function as an elixir is especially related to the confection of two powders. Note, these are usually referred to as a white and red powder, hence, along with their particular capacities in being able to transmute certain minerals into silver and then gold, respectively. It is these together that aid the initiate in procuring that of a true soma or medicine, otherwise the elixir, through a further colouring in which we call iosis or a purpling. I therefore invite the listener to participate in that great initiatory game as represented in the arts of alchemy and tarot, and whereby we must confect from both nominal and phenomenal subjectio and materia that which ultimately will lead to a pure form of being that is from out of the corporeality that is otherwise the lapis philosophorum. One might ask, why should we seek these occult forms? Well, one answer is that from one's own magical inquiries into both corporeal and incorporeal entities, the practitioner can, if required, begin to confect, as I have noted, a corporeal substance of the highest form, and one through which allows the initiate to achieve and sustain certain higher vibrations, a note which consists of both physical and noetic forms, respectively. As some suggest, this can be achieved by way of magically manipulating the occult or astral light through the Ophidian current, and then more corporeally through alchemical processes based on certain occult substances, namely the materia prima. Yet, we would do well to understand that both methodologies betray the initiate's use of creative esotericism. That is, wherefrom the initiate soon learns to activate and then manipulate the current through the serpent fire, and then certain minerals can then be charged and used to create the alchemical alkyst 
This process therefore combines both the noetic and corporeal, and thus we soon discover that the same methodology can be used in both alchemy and the tarot. Over the centuries, not only did the Philosopher's Stone become part of general occult legend, but also and along with the practice of alchemy unfortunately suffered at the hands of certain malefactors. As such, alchemical praxis throughout history and even today still continues to suffer greatly from the greed and hubris of certain uninitiated individuals. And though this has been a similar story with regard to many esoteric practices, however, and as I would suggest, there has never been more of an uptake in a culture as we perhaps see in today's younger generation. Yet, I would nonetheless caution that much harm has also been done to the magical arts in general, certainly by those who are less uh, well informed and even more so from those who are less proficient in actual magical operations. For even today, we find several so-called academic books and articles which link the term alchemy to economic business models and also fraudulent medical cures. These are used to consolidate the power and wealth of certain unscrupulous individuals, even to the extent whereby those who believe they are using some form of alchemy to manipulate the banking systems and from whose actions have created forms of hysteria promoting monetary advances and for large-scale pharmaceutical companies. Thus, overall, this highlights the use and abuse of alchemy and its practice for that of material gain alone. Nonetheless, I would suggest that those who are, perhaps, in it for the wrong reasons could in fact benefit from more psychological and or better philosophical frames of reference. That is, if they do indeed wish to understand the true function and practice of the alchemical and tarotic arts. Human greed should therefore not provide the ground for alchemical or tarotic research. For even in alchemical literature one finds stories that have sprung up of such individuals forced through kingly or corporate greed and which unfortunately have led to several famous alchemists, including Sir Edward Kelly being imprisoned and then tortured for his knowledge of the powders and indeed in that of the Lapis Philosophorum and transformation to perfection itself. For this reason, and for that of my own personal interest in esoteric subjects, including that of alchemy and tarot, has for over the past 40 years involved both theory and praxis, in which, as I have discovered, can in fact lead the practitioner of the art to that of a more personalised initiatory and harmonious gnosis. For now, we reach an important point in my talk. That is, that the overall processes and stages used in alchemical transformation can also be recognised as glyphed through the 22 major arcana or atu of the Thoth tarot deck. And whereby the tarot, when brought into line and activated with such initiatory schema and that of the arcana's alchemical function, can inevitably point the way to much greater clarity and understanding, especially in that of one's own true being. For we can in fact begin to understand in the alchemical pursuit for the stone of perfection a reality that as such embodies an everlasting human passion and also one in which I believe we strive for, that is to unify both the natural processes and indeed mystical function involved in creative esotericism. Yet, however, this can only truly be achieved through that of magic and the activation of the Ophidian current I would therefore argue that the practice of alchemy and indeed manipulation of the tarot stand at the intersection of scientific illuminism and thus at the heart of creative esotericism, not only as forming the cultural axis of ancient and contemporary creativity, but also through the practice of magic whereby a creative dynamis, a power, provides a substantive bridge between the mind and the hand vis-a-vis -vis the visual forms that can be invoked and which stand behind the meaning of the Atu themselves. For the practitioner, it is up to them to engage and activate those forms that lie hidden deep within the subconscious strata, and I, and thus, by creating a vacated space or hyperdochy between, say for example, two cards, into which they can then project both meanings and create a unified understanding. As we say, you don't read one card on its own, you merely interpret its glyphs and iconography. Thus, as I noted at the beginning, 
One of the key problems with alchemy has been in that of relating to its theoria and interpretation of the Lapis Philosophorum. For originally it was not regarded as a real substance, but was simply used as a metaphor for enlightenment and knowledge, typically being symbolised by the transformation of a rough, unhewn ashlar block, sometimes symbolising the leaden-like state of the uninitiated individual, who could, through craft and work, become like that of a true, sophically hewn, smooth ashlar block, and which then symbolised the purification and the purified individual, who was then likened to the perfected golden soul. Therefore, in many ancient and modern occult organisations, this journey to perfection is demonstrated merely through certain processes of initiation. However, that of the Ophidian current has remained hidden and where its meaning has been developed from far older sources detailed in ancient glyphs and iconography. It is from more ancient theory and praxis that was eventually subsumed to the symbolism of the Egyptian tarot. Um, and it is here that we discover that alchemy's original spiritual and corporeal teachings are described and can be actuated in the glyphs and iconography of the tarot itself. For this reason, uh, the Lapis Philosophorum was not considered as a possession or achievement of any singular individual, but was indeed that of a shared conception of those who are regarded as true lovers of wisdom, as exemplified through the general Greek term philosopher, and hence its later association with the Egyptian-influenced Hermetic philosophy. I therefore see nothing wrong with this type of Sophic outlook, but be warned, this is merely one half of the same coin. For this reason, there are two terms that prove useful when referring to different positions regarding for whom alchemy or indeed the keys of the tarot can belong. For example, we can ask, one, should they be viewed exoterically, that is, exoterically, Reverted for use by the masses, as in technological or, say, operational magic, thus only for the hands? Or two, should they be used more esoterically, as introverted knowledge studied and used only by the initiated few, that is, as contemplated theosophical magic only for the mind? Though this division is in fact somewhat illusory, we still nonetheless recognise the need to bifurcate absolutely everything that is into either more objective or more subjective points of perception. However, a more creative methodology is to narrate our understanding of both phenomenal and nominal consciousness through magical awareness. For although we do in fact seem to view them as separate entities, including those of the night side subconscious and day side conscious awareness, and yet if anything is to be gained from my talks, one thing is clear, that is in that we should perhaps use the age old Egyptian inspired Greek hermetic axiom in the pan, all is one, which is none other than that represented by the ancient cyclicity of the Egyptian Ophidian current, iconographically illustrated by the Ouroboros. Yet, what can we take from this somewhat perceived exoteric, esoteric bifurcation? It is none other than that which is based on the conviction that through activation, through the current and that of internalised self-reflection, that we are still required to participate in the corporeal world. But also, and this is the important point, vice versa. Thus, night side and day side, theory and practice are two sides of the same coin. This is represented in Egyptian magic by Heka and the activation of the Mehen serpent bark, which carries the mind's soul, compare my flesh of brand chamber of darkness. Thus, we find in the development of the Thoth tarot, as I provide in the Night of Pan, and which was prepared in such a way as to provide greater insight into the initiatory, alchemical, mystical and magical goals of the practitioner, and was for this reason one can discover that certain cards of the 22 major Atua trumps can be regarded as alchemical in function, or at least they refer to specific alchemical processes, and which, if undertaken by the practitioner, can lead them in part to a discovery of the great work. The four Kabbalistic universes, four elements, four colour scales used in the design of tarot have been applied to the four stages of alchemy. However, these are not completely in line with the number of processes and stages originally used in alchemical operations, and wherein there can be two, five, 
7, 11, 13, or even the most occult, 1. However, fear not, uh, for the number of occult operations have not stopped the use of what have traditionally become regarded as a four-stage process involved in the confection of the stone. These are 1. Melanosis or negredo, black, 2. Leucosis or albedo, white, 3. Catrinos or citrinitas, yellow, and then 4. Chochinos or rubido, red, and as I have hinted, this can be taken one stage further to a fifth, the iosis or the purpling stage. Thus, for some alchemists, the first step towards the lapis philosophorum was that stage of negredo, blackness. In this initial phase, all of the ingredients are subjected to putrefaction or decomposition. Thus is produced the massa confusa, a uniform black essence or chaos or tenebrosum darkness. Philosophically, this can be related to the first stage described in Libellus I of the Corpus Hermeticum, that better known as the Poimandres, and wherein it describes a downward tending darkness in the form of a serpent and from which genesis will later occur. Thus, the negredo can be interpreted as that state of non-differentiation, that between self and object, consciousness and unconsciousness. It was then followed by a growing awareness in the mind of the subject's own shadow aspect, hence its description in Libellus I. In the tarot and initiation, this is combined with a painful confrontation, self-criticism, disillusion and powerlessness, sometimes associated with a question mark, and that experience through initiation along the 32nd path of the tree of life and by the 22nd atu number 21 and which leads from Malkuth to Yesod and is glyphed in the Thoth deck as the universe atu. Thus the egg and the serpent are never far away, even at this stage of reduction. The second stage is termed the albedo or leucosis. This is a whiteness a process of purification from the centre of one's consciousness and where the chaotic particles of the mind's original state, otherwise massa confusa, are cleansed and where one can slowly begin to create that of a complicated virtual structure. This can be achieved through a process of meditation by basing one's creative visualisation on the construction of the cube of space or sphere of light. The corners of the cube can be extended to infinity. This is where one begins to project from that of a central point the three directions using the Taruatu, which are based on the three Hebrew mother letters Aleph, the fool and air, Mem, the hanged man and water, and Shin, the aeon and fire. The other elemental forces represented by Malkuth are the 32nd path at the heart of the sphere and individual. This creative process, using all of the 22 atu, can also be associated with the ordering of the cosmos, and which on the tree of life is unified through the actions of the atu art, and which projects from Yesod in the direction of Tifereth, and indeed vice versa. The third stage of Citrinitas, or yellowness, equates to the transformation of the lunar silver Yesod into gold Tifereth, represented by the solar dawn or awakening, a recognition of the knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel, a symbol of the highest value and beauty, hence its association with Tifereth on the tree and the Atu channeled to and from it. Students will now perhaps begin to see in the Atu an upward initiatory series of steps and which, when examined closely, parallel the alchemical transformation of the individual, as well as the stages that enable the alchemist to manipulate the materia prima by way of various processes. The fourth stage is that of rubido or redness. This is sometimes regarded as the final stage of the magnum opus and which, although it does on a material plane represent all that learned as an adept en route to Bina, understanding, and can therefore be glyphed as the achievement of wholeness and the deepest knowledge of nature, this is achieved by literally pouring one's whole essence as blood into the sublime receptacle or divine chalice of rebirth. Those who understand the symbolism, as I have described, will now realise that the red and white powders need to be manipulated by occult means from the materia prima, 
and that unified through hieros gamos. If one is adept, you will now, as a babe, be ready to cross the abyss, that is, by defeating that which stands against and which seeks to disperse one's higher conscious being. Then, if one is able to reach those supernal levels by confecting the stone, you will be required to complete the great work. Thus, the process of achieving the Lapis Philosophorum is concluded by using its ability of multiplicatio, and more importantly, by that of a reversed projectio back into the world of corporeality. Therefore, not unlike that of a teacher aiding parampara of the Aphidian current, the potency of the Lapis Philosophorum, and as such through its knowledge, can then be used if activated by a student practitioner. This can be seen in the Fool Atu, and where the secret is actually in the Fool itself, for zero, the Fool, equals Aleph, one, therefore not equals one. The source is in its manifestation, or in solving the one in the many duality, and which we see represented through the influx of incorporeal forms into the corporeality of the cosmos, and thus in that of our personalised initiatory participation through perichoresis, or better, our cyclic dance in the cosmos. Before we move to the final lecture in this short series on alchemy in the Thoth Tarot, there is much to be gained both theoretically and indeed practically from unlocking the hidden significance of the glyph on the reverse of the Thoth Tarot, that otherwise termed the Rose Cross Lamin or simply Rosy Cross. Although its design is relatively modern, it does nonetheless through its design contain much earlier magical and occult significance. Thus, for example, we see stylized alchemical symbols on the lobes of the rosy cross, representing on the air, yellow and earth green lobes, the glyphs of Mercury positioned centrally and representing as above so below, along with reflective reversals of salt and sulphur. On the fire and water lobes, sulphur and salt take the central positions respectively. Note how the white spirit square obviously has no lobes and reflects its centrality for the cube's function as activating the other four elements. Along with the rose, with the three layers of Hebrew corresponding to the 22 atu and the central cross and circle and dot within, reflect the point of origin and that which from all else expands as the central will of the individual. Some ask, why the three philosophical qualities are present as alchemical glyphs? The answer is simply that everything contains them as body, salt, sulphur, soul and mercury mind. Thus, when three are combined, vitriol, the universal solvent of our art, Atu, is hidden within the Orphic egg. And this foreshadows the original and indeed final stage of our great work. Thus, the unhewn cubic stone, as the body or ashlar, therefore symbolises the rough individual. One must therefore find and transform this rough stone or materia prima, putting it through alchemical stages, one can then achieve illumination. Yet the occult significance not only alludes to the square, the triangle, the circle, but that more significantly adeptly hidden in the confection and unification of the salves obtained from the pentagram and the hexagram. Many thanks for listening to this Black Lodge production. Please like and subscribe to our lectures on YouTube and keep in contact via our BLP Facebook page.